Hey, it's Justin Harvey. Thanks for tuning in to the Anesthesia and Pain Management Success Podcast. With APM Success, we take a close look at important topics pertaining to business, practice management, personal finance, and careers for anesthesiologists and pain management physicians. We work hard to take your critical questions straight to the experts. Thanks for listening. Hello and welcome to episode 147 of APM Success. I'm very pleased to be joined today by a friend of the show, Dr. Brian Schmutzler. He is an anesthesiologist. He's a practice owner. He has joined us for three episodes in the past, and he's one of these people who lives in the private practice realm in a way that I, I feel like he's he's got a special perspective and he has a lot of wisdom to offer people who are trying to understand where anesthesia and where the marketplace meet. So Brian, thanks a lot for joining us today. Thanks for having me again. Um, so tell us a little bit about the current scope of your uh, clinical and non-clinical duties, just so listeners who haven't been introduced to you before can get an idea. Sure, sure. Uh, so I'm a practicing anesthesiologist. I spend uh, every day at a hospital doing anesthesia, uh, a lot of supervision and um, uh, regional anesthesia, that sort of stuff. Uh, and then um, myself and I've got a couple of partners, uh, we run a management, anesthesia management company. Um, and more recently, we've sort of spun off a, a, a staffing division as well. So we, we do a, quite a bit of different stuff uh, each day. So how do you differentiate between anesthesia management and staffing? Uh, I mean, essentially in our hands, the difference between anesthesia management and anesthesia staffing is that the management portion, we do the billing and collecting uh, and then have providers who are truly on the payroll uh, from the staffing division. That's where the facility, the group, whomever we're staffing does the billing and collecting. We pay the providers a per diem or PRN rate and um, they're not, not full-time uh, contracted providers. They're just sort of PRN as needed. So. For any listeners who are interested, you can go back to episode 39, which is the first interview I did with Brian. If you want to hear a bit about his background, which is uh, diverse and varied. And I think part of the, you're listening to this guy thinking, how does he know how to like do all these different things? Um, he's, he's seen a lot of different parts of the anesthesia world and the medical world. And it has positioned him uniquely to be able to succeed at a time when it's, it's tough to succeed. Brian, tell us a little bit about uh, what you're seeing right now with the No Surprises Act. That's a topic that we have, you and I have dialogued about separately, and we've talked about a lot on this show. It's a, it's an interesting time in No Surprises land. Uh, yeah, for us, it hasn't affected a ton. Um, we were pretty solid on the contracts we had at the different facilities. Um, you know, as this was ramping up, we saw that certainly some of the payers, and I won't mention any names, on advice of counsel, um, we're already sort of using that to give us lower rates. And so we just accepted it. Um, and, and that's kind of the way we went forward with those payers. We still have some um, decent rates from some of the payers. Uh, we are finding that they are uh, denying more and we're having to go back and, and fight a little bit for the money. Um, I know you had a you had a guest on a while back who talked about the uh, the cost if you're going to uh, if you're going to fight a claim say that you you wanted to get paid more uh, it's something like two hundred and two hundred fifty dollars uh, to uh, to fight that to pay for the arbitration the loser has to pay the arbitration so we essentially uh, we argue claims that should have been to pay that were denied but we don't argue anything above the uh, the um, the payment level that we were contracted at. Uh, we have not been pushed out of network by any of the payers yet. Um, we still use a couple of clearing houses, which help a little bit with that to kind of buffer that, that issue. Um, so, so far so good. Most of our contracts are in year two of three. So we'll be starting negotiations here in the next probably four to six months. So I may have more info for you then, but currently, Great. currently not a lot has changed. Cool. So for any interested listeners, uh, I would encourage you to check out the show notes for today. We're going to have a lot of interesting cited resources. I went into an in-depth discussion with Dr. Mo Azum uh, a few episodes ago. I can't remember which one, but we'll put it in the show notes. So if you go to apmsuccess.com slash 147, check out that episode and some of the content we're going to discuss today. So Brian, you reached out to me uh, a week or so ago this ongoing discussion that you and I have been having about private practice and how anesthesia fits into what private practice means and the, the trends at a high level and what COVID has done. So talk a little bit about, uh, you know, this article that we just uh, checked out on Forbes and what you're seeing right now in terms of 
private practice in the anesthesia world? Yeah, the Forbes article talked a little bit about how, um, and I think we all know this as, as physicians, that private practice is uh, getting less common and more uh, physicians and providers of, of all types are getting employed by either large national groups or hospital systems. Um, the Forbes article, like you, kind of, you and I kind of talked about, it, it didn't say a whole lot new, but sort of uh, brought together all the, all the articles that have been coming out over the past couple of years. Um, you know, that there was a trend pre-COVID where a lot of private practices were getting gobbled up by bigger entities. Uh, I think during COVID from 2019 to 2020 uh, and into 2021, that precipitously increased. And then I think it's continued to increase, maybe not as quickly as the past couple of years, but precipitately, precipitously increased then and it's continuing to increase. Um, you know, the article talked about all private practices um, you know, I, I focus on anesthesia and I can't speak to really any other type of private practice aside from anesthesia, but I, I think we're seeing that locally as well. Um, and, and I, you know, we can dive into that whenever you want to get, get into that specifically. Yeah, for, for purposes of today's discussion, can you describe what you mean when you say private practice? Cause that means different things to different people. Uh, yeah. So in general, in anesthesia, what private practices looked like in my experience is, uh, several physicians, anywhere from 10 to 150, who own the practice, provide the anesthesia, uh, and then are partners within the practice. And obviously there's associate level and different levels of partnership and all that kind of stuff. But essentially the physicians, the anesthesiologists, and then depending where you are in the country, sometimes CRNAs as well, have an ownership stake in the practice itself and run it independently. Um, and so they're contracted with a hospital, a surgery center, a office, a dentist, something like that. So. And when we first had our uh, you know, initial discussion a, a year plus, maybe a couple of years ago now, uh, you know, I, I think you espoused a more, we'll call it an optimistic view. This is pre-COVID and we're talking about what it takes for an anesthesiologist who is a practice owner to continue to survive out there in the wild. And it seems like in the last year or two, based on recent events, based on your experience, you've been amending your opinion a bit, or it's been evolving in light of new information. So if somebody said, Brian, is it possible for private practice anesthesia to continue? What do you say to that? Uh, I think private practice, the way that we know it now, the, the kind of the description we just had is, is on life support, if not completely failing. Uh, you know, and, and I think in the discussion we had a year and a half ago, two years ago, I think we, something I had been talking about at the time was just being smart about it, that the way that private practice was being done in some realms was not going to, to continue. Uh, and, and I think the, uh, uh, sort of the factors that were a problem then are still a, a problem now uh, in the fact that, um, you know, when these, a lot of these private practices started in the late 80s, early 90s, there was plenty of money to go around. Insurance was paying a large amount for anesthesia. You could easily pay all of the partners, even if you weren't running the business as uh, efficiently or effectively as, as maybe you should have been. Um, and I also think there was less competition. Uh, there were fewer of these gigantic national companies, uh, fewer of the hospitals wanting to own anesthesia. And so I think even up until a couple of years ago, you could still kind of get away with that. Um, and as long as you were making some decent decisions, doing some shifting around and, and figuring out how to at least stay a little bit ahead of the trends, you'd be fine. Uh, I think COVID hit and that just like a lot of other things accelerated the decline. Um, and I think being a, not being um, almost 100% efficient, almost 100% effective, COVID really took a toll and then really precipitated even further decline of, of private practice in general um, and, and anesthesia specifically uh, because we as anesthesia providers are so dependent on elective cases. And so if you didn't have several months of money in reserve in the business, you really had a problem for the six months where you didn't have elective cases. Yeah. For any listeners who are looking for some data to sort of uh, back up what we're talking about today, referenced in the Forbes article was this um, slide deck essentially put together by this group called the Physician Advocacy Institute, which is uh, related to a group called Avalere Healthcare Consulting, A-V-A-L-E-R-E. -E. And we'll post a link to this in the show notes, but one of the numbers cited in that uh, presentation that I have here in front of me says, in the last couple of years, there's been 108,700 physicians becoming employees of hospitals or other corporate entities 
83,000 of that during COVID-19. So it really is a, a stampede, <laughs> it sounds like, stampede for the exit in terms of doctors that are moving from one side of the seesaw to the other. And I think exactly what you articulated, the, the small business challenges that any small business owner had to face, not just in medicine, but in COVID and what happened with revenue, you know, there were some federal monies available, but you can only keep your lights on and be available for so long before uh, you've got to start considering other options. So what, what is, uh, you know, your observation about the, are there other, what are the other reasons that this is, the landscape is becoming no longer navigable by private practitioners? Yeah. And, and so you and I talked a little bit about this and I kind of laid out my kind of five points why I think private practice, particularly in anesthesia, is starting to fail. Uh, I think just the design of many of these private practices, particularly larger private practices, there's just far too many decision makers and everybody's got their own uh, best interest in mind. And so it's really hard to take 15, 20, 50, or 100 anesthesiologists and make a, a decision that benefits the entire group and not one person or one subset of that group, um, which is which is why, I mean, if you look at any, any large company, there's one person who makes the, the majority of decisions, the CEO, or let's say even a, a board of directors who might be five, six people. Um, so I think just, just the design of an anesthesia private practice, at least the ones that I'm familiar with, really makes it difficult to, to make a decision. And then you postpone things for a long time, right? So, well, we got to wait to our next board meeting or we got to wait to our next partners meeting. And so you're paralyzed by inaction. And in the meantime, somebody like the practice we currently run can come in. I can pitch a contract in two days. We can get it signed a week later and you haven't even had your partners meeting yet. So I think that's a huge reason. Way too many decision makers, way too much just bloated um, and everybody trying to get in what they want to get in. So I think that's a huge, huge reason. Um, and, and again, you could get away with that three years ago when there wasn't quite the amount of competition and there was a little bit more flexibility and, and more money going around, but I you just, you can't get away with it now. So it sounds like having nimble leadership, if someone was going to, if a group was going to survive, empowering some managing partners or managing directors of a group to be able to, you know, execute the vision of the group on behalf of everyone is a necessary component for being able to stick it out. Yeah, I think that's a fair assessment for sure. Um, I think uh, the, the next point we kind of talked about was the lack of flexibility. So um, again, large groups, um, and this will kind of roll into staffing models as well, but large groups, really everybody's got a, a particular position every day. Um, and there's not a whole lot of, of I guess, fluff or overflow. Um, and that's by design because you make more money if you stay lean. Um, the problem with that is some days some other facility needs an extra person or, um, you know, somebody may say, oh, we lost our anesthesia group and we need you to help out in two weeks. Well, you can't wait for the next cycle of residents to come through or even the next cycle of CRNAs to come through. So um, I think the lack of flexibility of these big groups, they've got their specific places they go and specific number of people. And this is the number of people we have on vacation. And so I, I think the lack of flexibility in these big and even small private practice groups made it difficult as well um, to, to flex up and down for what, what hospitals and what systems needed. So for an organization like that, a hospital, for example, who, you know, has a new surgery center or a surgery center where a, a group lost a contract and they need to very quickly have a new anesthesia team there. Um, how, what type of group would be better positioned to be able to immediately handle that rather than the private practice group? You're talking just like a bigger, uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll give you style. I'll give you kind of two, two ends of the spectrum. So uh, there's the bigger national anesthesia, and I say management groups, not, not, um, <clears throat> not actual group groups. Uh, there's a little bit of difference in there, but the national anesthesia management groups are really good about moving providers around. Um, so again, with, there's one that we work with quite closely called Clinical Colleagues, CCI. It's a, a shameless plug for them because they've been fabulous in everything we've done with them. Um, so they've got providers all over the place and they'll move them around as needed. Um, I think they do that better than some of the big national anesthesia groups that employ a bunch of providers. 
Um, and so that, that's one way to do it. I, the other way to do it is what we've done, and hopefully I'm not giving away too many trade secrets here, but um, <clears throat> essentially we started a staffing division of our companies. And so I have, and honestly, we, I did this because I got tired of having to pay locums companies for, in general, poor quality providers, a lot of money. Uh, and so we have a huge pool of essentially PRN providers that we staff places with, but also I can staff locations that, that we have with. So if I'm short somewhere one day, I usually can find one of those providers to come over and help us staff. Uh, if I'm uh, overstaffed one day, which happens probably more often than being understaffed, that provider knows, well, they may not have work that day, but they're probably going to have work the next day. So, uh, I mean, I think for us in terms of flexibility, probably the best thing we did, and we honestly, we started this staffing company right in the middle of COVID. So it was a, it, it was a bit of a risk, but um, ended up paying off and we kept a lot of providers working uh, when they may not have been otherwise. Uh, but starting the staffing company, I think it has been invaluable for us and allowed us a ton of flexibility. Hmm. So that kind of bleeds into the other items that you had on your list here, but what are the other uh, challenges that face private practices that are going to make the model untenable in the future? Uh, so I think the staffing models, and this gets in a little bit to, um, you know, how are you using anesthesiologists versus CRNAs versus AAs? Um, I, I think at least in our practice, we kind of practice side by side with anesthesiologists and CRNAs, um, which again gives us more flexibility because I, I, as an anesthesiologist, can pop into a room, take over for a CRNA, a CRNA can pop in and take over for me. Um, now, obviously, pay attention to your state laws uh, and regulations, but um we're, we're very flexible in that way. I know there's a lot of groups out there that are very, very set on medical direction of CRNAs or medical direction of AAs. Um, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but staffing wise, that makes it very, very difficult. Uh, it gives you a lot less, lot less flexibility. Uh, and then you've got large all MD anesthesia groups still around, um, which again, if that's the way you want to go, you know, absolutely do, do what you're going to do. Uh, but I think that that model is very, very expensive. Uh, and so a lot of times um, groups that do more of a, either anesthesia care team model or CRNA and doc model are able to undercut some of those, uh, those contracts. So I think staffing models, there's a lot of private practice that's, that's very MD heavy, which I think is, again, another reason that it, being more expensive is not great in a time when everybody's looking to save money. So, Yeah. Uh, what uh, else? What other factors are in play? Uh, yeah, so, so the next one I have here is actually uh, paradoxically having too much staff. Um, and, and this <clears throat> this was something that occurred, I think, during, during COVID, number one. Um, and then uh, during uh, times when uh, there are fewer cases or it's more lean at locations. Um, so again, what we do is we have a lot of PRN providers. We have very few actually directly contracted full-time providers and a ton of PRN providers. So I'm not on the hook every week paying somebody for something, even if they don't work. Um, and so I think in private practice, you've got all the partners, all the po partners expect to be paid. And if you're going to say, well, you're sitting at home this week and not on a vacation week, the partners are going to be very unhappy about that. Um, uh, on, in our model with a lot of PRN providers, the PRN providers know they're not guaranteed work. Now, again, we talked at the beginning. I think um, a lot of times we, we end up right about where we should be or maybe a little bit overstaffed, but they know that they're going to get work. Uh, and so for us, having, um, having not uh, – we, we just don't have too much staff that are required to get a paycheck. Our staff are, are a lot of PRN. So, so I'm sure – I can imagine there's people out there listening thinking, sure, Brian, I'd love to have a bunch of people who don't care if they work or not. That sounds like a great deal for you. But the fact is, like, we don't have that. So what should we do? And it sounds like maybe finding people, calibrating expectations at the very beginning and building a pool of people who have that expectation that the work arrangement is going to be more flexible has been a contributor to your success. And I'd imagine it takes a while to get critical mass of those types of people. Yeah, yeah, it's taken probably a year and a half, two years to really get that critical mass. Uh, we had a, a lot of serendipitous things kind of fall in our favor uh, during that time um, where it brought in a, a lot of providers to us. Uh, and the other thing we do is we try to find them work. So I'm not, 
I'm not lazy about finding a work. You know, I, I know the number of providers I have available every day and I'm looking everywhere that we have, everywhere that we staff, even places that we don't necessarily staff who, who might need somebody to, to work. Um, and we'll, we'll send, you know, we'll even send PRN providers over to places that we don't have a staffing agreement with if that provider has, uh, has credentials at that place. We don't make any money from that, but at least that provider gets gets work for the day. And so we, we're pretty flexible with that. And I spend a lot of my time as we were talking about, um, just trying to figure out where providers go every day, scheduling and that sort of stuff. So, yeah. How do considerations around economies of scale, <clears throat> economies of scale fit in, uh, especially in light of, I mean, just, it's just the compliance hurdle just keeps getting higher and higher and higher. And now no surprises act and this whole arbitration thing. And we're like months and months before you get paid for the stuff that you did way back when. Yeah. So the economy of scale is interesting. That, that is, that was one of the biggest reasons that a lot of these private practice groups started joining together. Um, and even the large um, anesthesia groups across the country became bigger. They thought they had some economy of scale to, <clears throat> to negotiate with insurance companies, to negotiate with hospitals, that sort of stuff. I think the combination of COVID and the No Surprises Act actually kind of eliminated the need for that because you can't negotiate with these insurance companies anymore. The No Surprises Act essentially eliminated negotiation. So it's not like I can say to whatever, you know, new co insurance company, I'm going out of network and I'm going to charge people, you know, tons of money so that they get mad at you, go back to you and say, we want you to be in network with my company. It just doesn't work anymore. So a, a large private practice group, even if you had, you know, 50% of the providers in the state, you still have no leverage against the insurance companies and the hospitals. Is that now settled? Are, is that settled in your mind right now? I mean, it's going to go through the courts, but I, oof, I you know, I don't know. It's probably going to end up at the Supreme court. Don't you think? Uh, I don't know. That would be really interesting. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, it's settled for now. I mean, we, we have to treat it like it's it's going to be the law from here on out. Now, certainly, if it looks like it's going to get overturned, uh, I'll be one of the first ones in line going back to the insurance companies and saying, hey, guess what? You lost, so now I can go out of network. Uh, again, not to, and this is a whole other conversation, but again, not, not to stick the patients with a big bill, but as a negotiation point with the insurance company saying, you can't pay me something that doesn't even come close to paying cost for something that three years ago you paid us four times as much for. So, um, but again, I think currently at least economy of scale doesn't do much. And the hospitals are now looking for, they're looking for quality, but they're also looking for decreased costs, right? They're not flush with money like they were before. So a contract I could have pitched five years ago, there's no way I can pitch that contract now. I have to be much more cognizant of where that money's going. And we, we cut our margins, to be honest with you, we cut our margins back. Um, we, we had small margins to begin with, but we cut our margins back even further to be able to continue to provide the services that, that we uh, wanted to provide to continue to keep people employed and to I'm sorry, contracted. <laughs> we don't have any W-2 employees, so I'm careful with that. But uh, and, and to to just to continue to grow. So, so the cost control angle is always you know part of the pitch and the RFP, the request for proposal. We've talked about that mm -hmm. in the past. When the hospital raises their hand and say, "Hey, the anesthesia group we have is asleep at the wheel, and we want to see if we can get a better deal with better quality and less cost." And there was that paper that came out a couple of months ago. I'm hopeful to get some of the authors on this show that that closely looked at um, the impact of moving from, and I'm probably going to misdescribe this, but essentially looking at um, the value prop of the PE backed management companies saying like, hey, we're going to come in and with the, the special knowledge that we have about the best way to do perioperative care and quality and workflows and all these things, we're going to reduce cost. Um, and the hospital is going to save money and ultimately the patient probably will too. And what they deduced from this study was that that didn't in fact happen. And I know conversations that you and I have had in the past, even just economically, you look at the margins required to operate an independent anesthesia company, for example, versus one of the bigger national Private equity, companies yeah, yeah. versus yeah. a hospital. Maybe take a minute and just talk about the margins of those different sites of service and what does... How should we interpret the cost control discussion as it relates to different practice models? 
Yeah. So, I mean, the, the most expensive practice model is the private equity, right? Because there's a board of directors and there's that entire private equity firm who has to take their money out, not only each month or each year, but also at the end, they want to sell out to an even bigger private equity or something like that. So, I mean, that that's darn near the most expensive you could possibly think of. Um, you know, private practice is rather expensive as well because everybody expects to take not only a high value for their work, but then they expect to take dividends as well. And, and so you've got a hundred providers that are that are partners in that practice. That's a lot of mouths to feed. So, I mean, I think that's a high cost as well. Um, you know, at the large anesthesia companies across the country have huge administrative costs. I mean, they have large buildings, you know, look in the state of Florida, there's a bunch of them down there, gigantic buildings, tons of administrative, more administrative staff probably than they have of providers in some cases. Um, and, and so there's a ton of cost to that. Uh, now, again, we, we work with an anesthesia management company who is essentially remote. So they have very little administrative costs. So they do a pretty good job and they're margins, I think, and I'm not a partner in the company, so I don't know what their margins are, but at least from talking to them and looking at the contracts that they they have, their margins are far less than PE, far less than private practice, and far less than some of these gigantic anesthesia companies. Um, and then, you know, our, our margins are low as well, and I, I can't disclose to you exactly what they are, but we keep our margins very low because, again, we don't have a whole lot of overhead. Um, you know, I've got two partners, I've essentially got very, very little, uh, you know, we have some, some administrative staff, but just very, very minimal administrative staff. <clears throat> and so I, I don't have a ton of overhead. So the majority of the margin is used to pay whatever over, overhead we have. And then, you know, we all have other jobs too. So it's, it's not like our sole source of income is our, is our company. You know, we all, we all do other things. And so it's, um, you know, I, I think keeping margins low means keeping overhead low. And how do you do that? Well, certainly not by private equity. Sure. Um, so what should physicians who are either currently employed in one of these, you know, groups that you're saying are about to go the way of the dinosaur or people, maybe they're residents or fellows and trying to figure out what's out there and they're getting depressed <laughs> listening to what you're sharing. What should, you know, what action or what perspective would you want people to sort of take from this discussion? Oh, that's tough. Um, I, I mean, really vet the practice. And we talked about this before too. Really vet the practice you're going into. What do those contracts look like? Are you on, you know, year one of seven? Or are you on year six of seven? You're talking um, about payer contracts? Uh, payer and hospital contracts. So yeah. if you're looking to join a private practice group, uh, they're not going to tell you their payer contracts, I'm sure. But um, most payer contracts are three years anyway, and those change constantly. So I, <clears throat> I would look more closely at what your contracts are with the, with hospitals, facilities that you're that you're going to. If they'll show you or at least tell you, hey, we've got a seven year deal with uh, with this facility, our main hospital, and um, you know it's pretty solid. Versus we don't even have a contract. Uh, there, there are a lot of private practice groups, at least up until COVID, who worked without contracts anywhere. Um, we, we pulled a couple, a couple of those away because there's, there's really nothing to stop the, the uh, facility from, from going away from that group. So I, I would look at, at what, what the groups have in terms of contracts with facilities, uh, and then ask them what their plan is. I mean, knowing all this stuff, you, you know, you, you've got to say, hey, what's your plan going forward? Hey. Private practice is expensive for hospitals to maintain, unless your payer mix is incredible. But um, you know what, what's the pra what's the plan going forward? How do you see this practice moving forward in the next five years? Um, what's the provider mix? How many docs? How many CRNAs? How many AAs? What's the model? I mean, I'm just asking all the questions about things that we've talked about today to see if it looks like it's something that's sustainable long term. Makes sense. Any other um, words of wisdom or perspectives or angles at which you want to look at this topic today, Brian? No, I, I just think it's interesting. Uh, and that's why I sent the article to you. Uh, I think that article also said that uh, despite the fact that they claim that uh, cost is, is uh, less with um, either, either uh, hospital employed or, uh, or private equity backed, that actually the uh, cost to um, the patients is going up because yeah. of this uh, and the reimbursement to physicians is going down. Um, and so really the 
only people who are making who are making money off of this are insurance companies, hospital systems, and private equity. Um, it, it's not better for doctors. It's not better for patients. So, one important thing to note, uh, as you just said, you know the it not so. There's two ways to look at pay. One is nominal, and one is real. So nominal means like versus the no, the number this year versus the number from last year, and uh, and then real is once you factor in inflation and. Uh, reimbursement for like per work RVU or per ASA unit continues to go down um, in nominal terms. And then mm-hmm. you slap on the 10% inflation 10% that we saw inflation. in the last calendar year. And the the value of a doctor's work over the last 12 months has gone down like 15% for mm-hmm. what Medicare and sort of by association, all the commercial payers who stratify above them will, will pay, which is, that's what the, uh, that's what the practice is going to get paid. The private mm-hmm. practice is getting paid, and that's the the revenue, the the significant hit that is getting taken by these practices in terms of revenue. And that's another reason that it's it's just getting really really tough to to make that work. So one one of two things is going to happen. Somebody's going to have to chip in the difference because physicians and CRNAs and and all the providers aren't going to work for significantly less. In fact. Right. Uh, salaries or or PRN rates or whatever have actually skyrocketed, um, particularly for CRNAs, but they've gone up for for anesthesiologists as well over the last twelve months. So somebody's going to have to make up that difference, or you're just going to have nobody doing anesthesia anymore. Uh, you know, if it's not made up, nobody's going to work for a half in in real money, a half of what they were making five years ago. I mean, you just step out and do something else. So. Um, it's going to be interesting over the next few months to see where things go for sure. Is there a world in which the No Surprises Act and these other market forces that are being brought to bear are so detrimental to these companies that private equity firms purchased with the hopes of really cashing in? If that cash register isn't ringing in the background anymore and the owner, the investors who own significant stakes in these companies start to offload them or they see that the the outlook in terms of revenue and profitability significantly diminished. Uh, what, what happens then? Uh, well, I mean, a lot of them have started to back out already. I think we had this discussion when we were talking about private equity on one of the, one of the conversations we had, um, you know, the, the private equity firm that backed one of the large national anesthesia companies declared bankruptcy or was on the verge of bankruptcy. I can't remember all the details, but um, you know, so I, I think that, the anesthesia practices are less and less attractive to private equity. And those that are in it, I think are only now staying in it in order to try to get back the money that they lost. I I think that the days of private equity, again, who knows what's going to happen with the No Surprises Act, but I think the the private equity firms don't see anesthesia as a, uh, as really a, uh, a practice to type to really go after anymore. We're not as, we're not as enticing as we were five, seven, 10 years ago. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. And for anybody who's interested, there's a, they're, they're called ratings agencies, which is basically a company whose job it is to assess the financial viability of any company out there and to give a quote unquote objective opinion about that. There were some problems with that in the past in 2007 through nine, um, but that has largely been rectified. And if, you, if you're curious what objective uh, professional observers think about any big, private equity backed company, for example, you can just Google like Fitch's F I T C H or Moody's are two examples or S and P. Um, these are companies that assess financial viability and lots of the, it's not just an anesthesia. Many of these private equity backed companies that own a lot of doctors look not very good <laughs> in the eyes of, uh, professionals who are trying to figure out how financially healthy they are. So yeah, I'm, uh, I, these are uncharted territory, uncharted waters, uh, and we're in new territory. And so it's, uh, it's an exciting time to be alive, I guess. I'll just use this opportunity to make a plug for, and this is something I talk about with my clients, building margin in your life. I like to use the analogy of a, if your, your life and your financial life specifically is like a castle, you want to have a wide moat all the way around it because these healthcare forces are going to continue to play out in a directionally similar, because this is like a big glacier, just a lot of the, the momentum is unstoppable in these, and barring, you know, I saw Bernie Sanders just proposed the Medicare for all 
you know, yeah. what this is going to look like in the latest iteration. Who knows? Uh, that would be bad news for anesthesia, by the way. Um, but uh, building margin in your life financially and professionally to be able to be nimble, to be able to make adjustments, to be able to, you know, if you're uh, practice loses a contract or your practice gets absorbed and what you find on the other side isn't something that you like, the flexible are the people who are going to thrive in that environment rather than people who have significant fixed costs on a monthly basis and who have lifestyles that don't allow them to make any adjustments. So I think that's the one takeaway I guess I'm concluding from all of this is there's significant uncertainty in the future of this specialty and especially for private practitioners uh, build your financial life as if uh, change may happen because it may, and it may not be advantageous. And build your practice that way too. I mean, having, having margin within your practice, you know, having cash yeah. on hand, 60, 90, 120, 180 days of cash on hand, not only personally, but, but within the practice is really helpful as well, because then you're, you're able to keep, keep people whole for that time. You know, I don't think COVID's going to happen again, but there's going to be lean times and, and having that margin, I think helps a lot too. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Dr. Brian Schmussler, thank you very much for joining us today on APM Success. Thank you. If you liked what you heard this week, head on over to apmsuccess.com where you can find more content and free resources to help you build a successful career in anesthesia and pain management. If you wanted to leave a review in iTunes, I'd also really appreciate it. Thanks for using some of your valuable time to join me today on APM Success.